So sorry about the video, everyone. Uh, it's apparently what's what you get when you get a Chromebook to present. Brand new. Don't know why that happened, but uh, hopefully you can still see most of the screenshots and things. If, if you can't, just shout it out, and I'll uh, try to explain a little a little more. Get my going. So uh, this is my presentation. My name is Jeremy Brown. Um, it's about ha hacking virtual appliances. Uh, if you're not too familiar, I know a virtual appliance sounds a little abstract. Uh, if you're not too familiar with, you know, different forms of them, how they work, or you've never even heard the word, um, you'll know more about it soon. But, uh, so agenda-wise, uh, we go through the introduction a little bit, uh, going through some public examples. So this presentation has a lot of uh, bugs in it. It's, it's heavily, and I'll show you uh, some of the different analysis techniques, um, and you'll you'll see various uh, you know, security things throughout. But uh, there's a ton of bugs in this. Uh, some are fixed, some are not fixed. Um, so if you pay attention, you may find some uh, a few gems scattered throughout. Then I'll go into some of the newer bugs. So, so these are some of the bugs I found through the last few months uh, of my research, uh, with the various different categories, some documented accounts, undocumented accounts. Uh, password litter is really an interesting one in this space, in virtual appliance security. And then I'll show you where to go from here and uh, how vendors can start fixing these. And, uh, and at that point, you should get a pretty good understanding of how to uh, exploit these. So uh, I'm an independent researcher slash consultant, uh, formerly Microsoft. Uh, I was on the Windows Phone Xbox team. Um, Malware Protection Center before that. Also worked at Tenable for a while. Anybody from Tenable in here? I don't Nessus? OK. I might see some old colleagues, but um, did worked on Nessus there, you know, plugins, different things like that. So first of all, what I'm not talking about. Um, not talking about uh, web app bugs that don't directly lead to a shell. Um, also, not decrypting VM images. Uh, this is stuff you know you need to look at or have the keys for before you start uh, looking for bugs. What I'm going to be talking about is uh, remote shells. I mean, that seems to be everyone's favorite thing to um, command through various different ways: command injection, backdoor accounts, uh, and then once we have a shell, if it's not already root, escalating to root. And there's some other interesting bugs too you'll see along the way. So what is a virtual appliance? Um, it, of course, you, you can figure out what a physical appliance is. Uh, if they just think of a virtual appliance, uh, it's taking that physical appliance and converting it to, for example, a VM image or something you can install uh, on a hypervisor and run in a data center or run in the, the various uh, VM software that you can, you can uh, get off the shelf. So it's just literally an, an operating system, all software-wise, no hardware, uh, virtualized. So the examples here are like physical appliances. Give them a box, some Ethernet jacks. You know, usually restrict the functionality and uh, lock everything to a support contract or, or otherwise. Virtual appliance is more like, hey, let's just dump all and configure all the devices software to an OS and distribute it as a VM image. So simple enough concept. And this is really becoming popular these days as uh, you know things are moving more to bigger metal and. Uh, you know, moving more from smaller devices to, to data centers and the cloud and all that stuff. And one interesting quote I found off uh, this, uh, this one reference uh, at the bottom, physical applications no longer need to be shipped across national borders. That was pretty interesting because I, I hadn't thought about that is actually a perk of having, uh, being able to, you know, download or, or virtually receive something, um, you know, over, over the internet rather than having to have it inspected uh, at the border. That was, that was something uh, that they're really getting maybe more other countries that aren't, aren't uh, that are looking to kind of bypass some of those checks. There's an important distinction here too uh, with virtual appliances. Whatever is shipped, uh, these bugs are you know, universal throughout everything that's shipped. So it's not something that are created upon provision. You don't need to install any apps for these uh, to occur. You don't need to install Adobe Reader. You don't need to install uh, all these other things that are, that are popularly, popularly exploited through uh, using bugs through third-party apps on the OS, everything is already pre-installed. So what we're doing, we're looking at the security of, of the device upon install and seeing what's available and uh, looking at the security assumptions made from there. So some of the popular uh, vendors for these, 
And they're becoming more and more uh, vendors are, are buying into this, this way to distribute uh, the appliances. Uh, IBM, EMC, HP. Uh, the interesting one about AS, uh, SAP is uh, they had a lot of uh, different trials and demos, but they're only cloud only. So you can actually get your hands on the, on the, uh, the, uh, the image to look at. So thanks a lot for that. I, I really would like to have some fun with SAP devices, but I uh, couldn't quite uh, analyze them too well on the cloud. So the pros and cons for buck hunting that I, that I came across, they're usually likely to say, uh, share a lot of the same code. Um, and the common mindset among vendors at this point, uh, they s still assume for a lot of physical devices, you usually don't, I mean, they, they may not come with root privileges. So you can't uh, meander around the operating system as you'd like. Um, so the common mindset leading to shipping virtual appliances is a lot of times you can get root in, in whatever way, either they enable it or through another bug. So it leads them, to inter, uh, leads them to ship a, what I'm calling a litter box of just things they've left on the box that are not, um, you know, they probably shouldn't have or they assume someone else didn't have access to. And the only really con I can think about this is, you know, when you buy something and you have a problem or, you, you know, all these enterprise devices, some of them be pretty, unless you're deeply in the industry of like IT or, or otherwise, you really can't figure out how to even configure them or install them sometimes. You literally spend a lot of time to look in documentation and trying to figure out how to install this thing. So you can't really make support calls with a lot of these, uh, you know, if they're trials or if they're, uh, if you, you know, get them, get them otherwise, you're looking at a friend's device or something like that. Um, but that's not a big deal anyways. So why would anyone go after these appliances? Um, especially if, you're, if you, you haven't looked at one yourself, you're like, you know, why are these important at all? Um, as I mentioned before, prevalence. Um, they're, they're steadily gaining popularity. You can see a lot of physical devices, and the vendors are offering to ship both either the physical, they'll ship to you, or allow, you know, send you the link to download the, the virtual uh, after you purchase it or, or whatever way. And uh, I'll go over entertainment a little bit in a bit, and also value. Um, so the entertainment portion, um, I'd like to show you a few screenshots. Now, these aren't actual bugs, but these are just funny things that I thought that I found along the way. So, uh, and some of these uh, I can't remember the names of, so, you know, you can ask me about later, but I can't remember which, which screenshots some of these are for, for which virtual appliances. But uh, like here's one, for example, you know, literally the quote for these is, here's an image of my work PC. Um, they literally let the uh, bash history, uh, love the known host on the device when they ship, or on the appliance when they shipped it. So it's just it's kind of fun to look at uh, and see you know, who they're talking to, what commands they were doing. You might even find some other interesting things. You might even find some passwords in that later on. Um, and then this one's like you know just leaving in the configuration files, whether upon install or not, uh, just leaving passwords there. Uh, this one just around uh, just more passwords. There's a ton of passwords uh, literally all across the on the system. This one's really good. Uh, so. You know, the common thing is like, all right, don't leave passwords in the, in the log files. And I can just imagine that this guy was like, okay, I won't leave the password, you know, I'll, uh, I'll just hash it. It'll be fine. Well, he didn't apply any salt to it. So I'll have to do, copy it, run it through uh, a rainbow table system, and we get cluster password. So that's one of those check marks. All right, boss, I don't have any passwords in the log file. Well, you didn't salt your password, so anybody can uh, run it through a table at this point. Um, more passwords, some of these, like this one is a uh, SQL server, or not SQL server, a database server on the system, and uh, the .pg pass was left on the system, so it's not available remotely, but locally you can just, you know, get the password, log, log into the database, and you got free range at that point. Not really a bug, because you can access it remotely, so it's kind of, it's kind of limited like that, but um, still, entertainment-wise. Um, this, this one's actually a password from a remote server. I don't think this works anymore. Um, but when they were, they were trying to download a password protected file off this website and uh, actually left that in the install file. Can you guys read these okay? Everyone reading the text on the screen? I know the screen size is a little small, but is it thumbs up? Can I get some thumbs up somewhere? Okay. okay. Kinda? Okay. All right. I'll continue to regurgitate what I can see as well. It's a little small on my screen, too. Um, and then just to so these internal, uh, like, for example, obviously this is the IBM, I hope, uh, virtual appliance. So you can see uh, them SFTP in with uh, the internal, the internal servers with usernames. 
just because they forgot to delete this when they shipped it. I mean, this is nothing, I didn't do anything special, but look at the file system here um, at this point. And this one, the, they sued rooted the ID binary. I don't understand why anyone would ever sued root the ID binary. There had, to be, there had to be some app checking that, and that was like the hack around whatever check was like, well, if it thinks it's root, it'll continue. So I just, there's no point in that. I don't understand. So it's enough of the entertainment. We'll get into, you guys remember the Super Bowl? Yeah. Uh, we'll get into the uh, more detailed stuff after we talk about value. So obviously it's used in enterprise um, and uh, you can see that a lot of times customers really want these bugs fixed. These are things that they're buying, they're paying a lot of money for, and they don't want uh, you shipping them a uh, appliance that has a backdoor account on it, or hat, you're shipping all these all this collateral left on the system. They want something a little more professional than that. And, and why is security so bad? It, this is a screenshot of uh, this one virtual appliance where the in instructions were, okay, here's here's the root password. Here's the user password. You know, this user has sudo rights. It never talks about changing the password. It never talks about um, you know, randomly generating on install. Um, I mean, it's, it's, really, it's really just about, oh, here's, here's an image. Just go play with it and figure it out. And it's kind of what it looks like at, in the end when you get the actual appliance. So, and how do you get these things? Here's another question you may be wondering. Oh, well, how do you get access to these? On the website, I mean, if you look for free trial, request evaluation, um, you can look for demos. You can actually make a purchase, so you can, if you want to make an investment that way, you're like, okay, I think I'll find uh, bugs in this device, um, and you know, maybe be able to make a living somewhat off that. Uh, you can make a, make an investment with them too, and sometimes they're just not available. That that gets super annoying where you you see this really juicy virtual appliance, and there's not a way to buy it. There's you have to have some, you have to be either be a company, you have to have some support contract in some way. You just cannot buy it uh, in, individually. So it's not so good for us. So public examples, these are some of the things that uh, I've sold that are already public that I just saw were, were try to get you in the mode of bugs for these devices. So we have, in Sofo's uh, web app appliance, or sorry, web protection appliance, there's a, there was a command injection vulnerability found a couple years ago where on the interface uh, you, know, you can insert commands in the URL parameter. And this was supposedly fixed in 2013 and tested earlier this year is actually still works. So there's, a, there's an advisory uh, by I think it's what, SEC Consult Group and in the advisory they show a really detailed timeline and they show, okay, this bug was confirmed fixed, by, or Sofo said it was fixed at this point. I'm not sure if they ever confirmed that, but uh, like I said, I tested it earlier this year, and this still actually works. Uh, so there's command injection in Sofo's web appliance unpatched. And also, there's, there's a Horton, Hortworks Sandbox. Um, they have a bunch of customers. Uh, you can see eBay and CDW and uh, Priceline and stuff. So it's a way to get uh, work, start working on Hadoop, and it's more like a developer system. But if you think about internally, how many how many of these customers, how many of these companies use this internally and set up these dev boxes? I mean, if you're in a pen test, you're red teaming, whatever you may be doing, uh, and you find these on the network, um, the security is really bad. They and they don't encourage you to do anything. Um, I mean, for example, VA grant VA grants is a password has pseudo privileges. And if you look at one of the presentations I saw about uh, setting these up, you know, they talk about setting security up is hard. Uh, most developers don't test with security. It's all stuff we know, but in the, you know, in the real world, when you set one of these boxes up, you're instantly vulnerable as soon as you, you know, start, to, start the appliance. And, and anyone who knows VA Grant, VA Grant can, can get root on your box and escalate from there. So it's a couple of things to get you in the mode of the, some of the things that I'm looking for and some of the things that, that you can find if you start looking at these appliances. So here's some of the bugs that uh, I'm going to go over that I found. And like I said, some of them fixed, some of them are unfixed. Um, and uh, let's go into it. But before that, uh, file system analysis 101. So I want to tell you a little bit how I did it, my approach to it. 
Uh, so dynamic view. I'm talking about dynamic and static view when I talk about this. So dynamic view, boot up the system, you know, what you see is what you get. Uh, you just load the VM image into the hypervisor. If it's OVF file, OVA file, whatever package it comes in, if it's a you know, VHD, uh, you load it up, and there's a couple limitations here. Uh, if you don't, uh, if, if you don't have root or the, or the shell that you have is locked down, it kind of uh, it prevents you from looking at some of the things. And, and, but it is motivation to find the escalation bugs at that point. Uh, but if you look at static view, you no, know, it, it's, it's just uh, converting the raw file system. So if you get one of these packages, they'll give you, it usually comes in um, a OVF, which is, which is like a container for the, uh, for the drive that all the stuff's installed on for the image. And if you convert those images to raw file system, and then you look at it using an imager or forensic software of some sort, uh, you can just look at the file system, you can uh, download files from it, uh, you can look at interesting things like the shadow files, you know, what it already has on it, if there's any interesting accounts there. Uh, you can use regex to search the file system to look for different interesting patterns, like other passwords, other, other uh, other relevant things that they may not want to ship there, or maybe they're installing something uh, that's, that's interesting. Uh, but the only limitation here that, that kind of got me a couple times was uh, the first boot scripts. So uh, one example, I, I was literally looking at a um, an image, I'm like, oh yeah, I have a, you know, there's a remote right here, they have this account, and it's got a default password, and they never document it, it's great. And then uh, I ran the first boot script and installed the OS, or installed the, uh, you know, did all the configuration for the appliance, and that went away. They changed the password somehow. And tracking that down gets a little hard too because the install scripts are everywhere, um, and they do it in all these crazy ways. Uh, and sometimes you can find them. Sometimes you can see what they set the password to. It's a lot easier than cracking the hash at that point, especially if it's a complex password. Um, but the point of that is, Whatever they set that, whatever the password is, if it's not generated upon install, and I don't think any of the examples I'm going to be showing you are, except maybe one, and that's pretty rare, but that's the way to do it, um, that's universal across all of them. So if they put some account in there that has some crazy password, and it, if you can figure it out in any way, you just got a remote on that appliance. No questions asked. So, Documented accounts. Uh, this one I want to start off with. It's in Cisco Paging Server, so it's a virtual appliance uh, from Cisco. It's OEM software, single single wire software. If, if you're interested in looking it up, um, there, in this one there's an SSH daemon, a webman, and a web interface. Now the first two, SSH and webman, they share obviously share the same uh, authentication system, but the last one is separate. So what happens when you change the pa admin, pa admin password for the web interface? Logically, it doesn't change the first two. Now, in the documentation, when it tells you to change the admin password, it only refers to the web interface. So even, uh, even if there is, you know, there's two separate systems here, so you're only changing one, and it never talks about the webman or, or, or remote shell. So even though the password is change me, you will never change it unless, unless you just want to because you, you, know, you know the system that well and you're like, oh, this is bad. I'm running webm in and I didn't change the password. But they never mentioned to do this. Um, so you use change me and you have admin no matter what, no matter how many times you change the, the uh, web interface's password. So you can write it down as a documentation bug, whatever, uh, but now you can just go own a bunch of paging servers because no one's going to change that password, most likely. Uh, next one, EMC PowerPath. So it's another virtual appliance I looked at. Uh, if this one catches you, catches your eye real quick, that's because they, these two accounts uh, are undocumented. So con contains an EMC update and an SVC user, service user, perhaps. And if you try cracking these passwords um, by throwing a dictionary at them, as everyone does, EMC password, EMC's password is password. This is not in the documentation at all. So, we just log in, and I don't think this one has webman or remote shell, but you can log into the web interface with this. And uh, so, undocumented account. I never did finish cracking uh, SVC user's password, although when I, uh, when I talked to EMC, they did remove both the users, so maybe they just made a really complex password for EMC user, and I didn't find it on the file system anywhere. Um, 
but this is this is one example, and they were really actually fast in fixing this, like a month. So congrats to EMC on that. Um, the next one, IMB, uh, IBM cannot speak today. Smart cloud monitoring. So I didn't test the uh, official version of this. This was just uh, most of these I'm testing like the official uh, version, but this one I only tested the trials. So I want to call call that out just in case something may be different because I, I didn't test the other one. But uh, there are six users on the system that have uh, bash shells, two of which aren't documented. And it's like DAS user one, DB2, SD, a bunch of stuff. Um, and so in the documentation, they have, they document a couple of the other users with the password of SmartWay. But they don't talk about these at all. So these are two that use the password in the documentation but aren't talked about themselves. So there's a remote shell uh, on the smart cloud trial at least. Uh, this one, VMware uh, Horizon Mobile Manager, another virtual appliance from VMware. Uh, I know you probably can't see it, but there's a user called MMP, user MMP on the system, undocumented. Let's get a shell. So I actually reported this one to, well, I didn't, oh, I, did, I did send the information. VMware contacted me like three days ago. They said, hey, saw you're doing a talk at DerbyCon. Want to know if you're talking about any VMware stuff. I said, yeah, I am. Uh, would you like to know more about it? I didn't, I didn't even ask that. I knew they wanted to. But like, please send us an email at secure at VMware. So if you ask me, I'll tell you. So I sent them all the information uh, three days ago, and I'm like, fixed it by now. But there's one caveat with this one. Uh, the product is actually into life pretty soon, uh, November this year. I looked at this a few months ago and actually had more time. But um, And I did not have 131, although I did look at the release notes, and there was nothing about security updates. So I'm pretty sure that still works on 131. Um, but yeah, VMware is investigating this now, and uh, either going to fix it or just be like, eh, two months, customers will be okay. I don't know. Um, the next one was interesting because it was a silent, silent patch. And I know everyone loves silent patches. Lots of companies do them these days for various reasons, uh, which make a lot of company sense, but not so much to uh, customers. But Sev1 uh, is a network. They they offer MM NMS uh, network management system, and uh, a lot of these companies like them. Yeah, HBO uses them, Verizon, maybe Game of Thrones uses them, I don't know. Um, but there, so when I was looking at this uh, virtual appliance, I found undocum another undocumented account, uh, CMCDR user with same password. And I was like, all right, that's great, that's a remote. And also, I was looking around the system and there's a sewage root binary called ASLOOKUP, some custom binary. And if you just, Pass a large first argument, you can straight up stack overflow AS lookup. So, depending on mitigations and all that stuff, but you can kind of consider that a privilege escalation uh, you know, to be on the safe side if you ex exploit the buffer overflow. So, I did a search for CMC DR because that's what you want to do to make sure you're, you're not, you know, you didn't miss this somehow. Um, and it's not actually a documented account. So, did a search and I found some release notes for a later version on some random website and the URL had been removed. That was super suspicious to me. I'm like, it's not even the Sev1 website. And they already took it down. But thankfully, we use Google Cache and we're able to still see what it was. So you probably can't read it, but uh, page 13, remove shell access for CMC DR user. Uh, the next one, AS lookup, corrected an issue. So pretty big issue. Um, so. This is for, I tested three, three, was it three, sorry, 536, uh, and it was apparently fixed in uh, 538, and I can only assume they did some pen tests right before that release, and they're like, oh, you guys have a lot of bugs here, and they just released it, and you can't even download, publicly, you can't even download 538. So it's like, I guess if you're a customer, hopefully you can, because um, that was just a weird timing issue, I guess, itself. Uh, but I caught that one right before they completely removed everything. Uh, also, for you old timers here, you may remember uh, format string bugs. They're still around a little bit. Um, this is in the SolarWinds Log and Event Manager. Uh, in the ping command, if you give it a percent %p, it will give you a memory address. Uh, and you might think, well, that's not exploitable. Well, it's probably hard. But there is a 2005 paper about that, uh, about exploiting uh, format strings issues in Perl and 
maybe Python 2, I'm not sure. Uh, but that was, that was in the Login Event Manager. Uh, Cisco Prime Infrastructure, so another virtual appliance from Cisco. Cisco's got a lot of virtual appliances, by the way. Ton. Um, so on this one, <laughs> I like their slogan, Simplified Management from Branch to Data Center. Um, so if you look, if you get access to the system and you look at these uh, SUID binaries, uh, and I'm, I'm looking at them as like root right now, but I'll, it's just to get a full view of the system. Uh, there's 67 SUID binaries. So that should strike you as a lot. Normally, maybe there's what, 20 or 30 on a normal system, 67 over double, that, that rings a bell. So if we just, if you just grep for shell under the names of these commands, there is one, there are two commands named run shell command. Run shell as root. These are sewage. They do what they, they do what their name suggests. So, uh, and I know you can't read this, but th I was just trying, I was wanting to give you a picture of the disassembly so you can kind of look at what, uh, what the code looks like and as it's running the shell and how, and I don't, I'm not trying to bash on developers or anything, but this is poorly written. Uh, <laughs> If you, if you don't give it an argument, they don't even check if there's an argument given. So they really don't expect anyone to run this because if you just run it trying to get the help options or something, it will segfall you know, at a null pointer. And it's like, you didn't even check to see if I gave you an argument. Uh, that kind of adds to the code quality of what we're going to expect coming forward. Uh, I, just, I just couldn't believe they didn't check for an argument. That was just... That was I don't think I've ever saw that in a, in a real program before. Uh, so let's give it an argument. Maybe it'll do something cool. So it reads uh, arguments from a file, and as you would expect, run shell is root. Um, it's going to run that command. It's root. A little disambiguated, but you, know, just, you get it. Um, what about the run shell command? Yep, it does. Ex it's even easier. I don't know why there's two commands for that. It must be something to do with their scripts, uh, locking it better like that. They don't know how to use S10, something like that. Um, but I gotta give it credit, they really stepped up security. They only sued rooted the user add binary available to the root uh, user and group. So, you know, that's, that's really good, but it doesn't help when we have uh, another binary that we can run it as root. Uh, so the exploit for this one uh, when you when you have a shell in the system to pr escalate privileges, just use run shell command, which is sued root, and just execute the user add command and give yourself a uh, root two user on the system. <clears throat> All right, the next one, Prime Collaboration Assurance. I know there's a lot of Cisco Prime virtual appliances, and I know you're going to get them mixed up, um, and there's really, frankly, nothing I can do about that. Uh, I don't, I can't change the names, but there's a lot of Cisco Prime virtual appliances. Um, but you can look at the slides later if you're interested in which bugs pertain to particular ones. Uh, so there's two accounts on this system, and a root password is set up on install, and a CM user password is only reset up on login. Take a second to digest that. CM user password is only reset up on login. By default, the password is CM user. Okay, so you may say, well, it's not really a bug because as soon as we log in, I'm going to I'm going to set it something else. Well, what if you never log in? What if you just set up the virtual appliance and you're like, yeah, I'll take care of this later? What if you never use the same user account? Maybe you just use the root account for whatever. So, not widely exploitable, but I think worth the case study. So, going on the issue of okay, we can we can get a shell with CM user or whatever whatever other way. Uh, there's an interesting SUA binary here called firewall. Guess what that does? So there's, there's, there's another service running on the system that is block, currently blocked by the firewall. On the EM, SAM, perf, engine, it's just a Java debug server. They named it something crazy. Um, so I don't know if you guys have ever looked at Java debug server or heard of it. Uh, it was murdered a few, uh, a few, I guess a year or so ago. Uh, when I say murder, of course I mean like hacked to death. Um, via, what are the guys, IO Active? They did a bunch of stuff on it. So basically, you can get a remote root on any uh, Java debug server running, unless there, maybe there's some crazy configuration, but any default Java debug server, uh, you can turn it into root. 
And so how do we access the server? Yeah, we can, we can run the exploit locally, whatever, but why don't we just turn the firewall off? How about that? Let's just turn it off because we have those privileges because it's a suit binary. So if we do that and then run the, the exploit they provided, IOActive, uh, we can get a remote on the prime collaboration assurance. So remote root from there, using Java debug server. Seriously, look for these things. I think it's an 8010 uh, is the default port too. So if you ever see 8010 on a, on a system, check that and see if it's Java debug server. If it is, you, you have a remote root, like almost guaranteed. Hello, you only live once. So there's also more uh, binaries on the system if you're interested. Firewall is just one. Uh, there's also like a Haltio uh, web console. And if you look up the default password as admin admin, I'm not sure what you could do there. I didn't really spend a lot more time on that. But if you're interested in this appliance, uh, take that take that note. So next one, password litter. This is it's probably one of my favorite ones just because it was so, it's kind of unique to virtual appliances. These other ones you can see on a lot of other systems. Uh, but this one is, is is pretty unique to actual virtual appliances. So supported by Cloudflare. Um, so it makes it a little more popular. And it does actually a good job at, you know, as mentioned before, generating random credentials is important. Um, because a lot of these things, they use default passwords. That's just so, it, it's just lazy and easy for anyone to screw that up. So just, you know, this one, on-site key is a, is a password at this point. So it generates it uh, upon boot, which is great. But they made a mistake. They forgot to remove the bash history. And not only that, there was a typo in the bash history. God, what could that be? Could it be the password? Yes, it is. So they actually made a crazy good password. Uh, what's it? Crazy good. It's pretty good. And used that uh, for the appliance, but they did. They accidentally typed it when they were uh, trying to SU2 it later uh, beforehand. Then they shipped the appliance. Now I look at it, find that password. Now this is for the admin user. So there's actually another user on the system as well. But the uh, Fenomptia admin user, it actually has, well, pseudo privileges. So they did good security by, you know, a lot of other ways, generating the password, but they forgot to delete the uh, bash history and other, probably other sensitive files as well, and ended up getting a ro remote root on their probably good product. So that can happen. Also, yeah, and this is just a quick note. Also keeping static passwords for users other than the Penopia. I, I told you that was that was an alternative user. There's actually another admin user on the system. You know, food for thought, that was interesting where they were keeping static passwords. So like, is that for them to log in later when you ask for support? Because you never see that password, right? Unless I just told you. That was, that's kind of an eye opener in virtual appliances too. Um, and finally, bootloader access. So I want to touch on this briefly. So on Sophos web application proxy, I think it's the same one we, we looked at earlier with the public bug. Um, they use, so if you look at the file system statically, you can see in the uh, boot manager, in the grub, grub menu list, uh, they put a password of crack crack. I don't know if that's to taunt people or what, but I was like, crack crack, all right. Sophos, crack crack. Um, and of course, we can use that uh, to get access to the bootloader, even though they password it, but uh, because we have access to the file system. Um, but something else I looked at, and, and I know Sophos probably doesn't care about the boot password or whatever, we have other things to deal with. Um, but they forgot, but I looked at an older shadow password that they had used, and the password for root was crack. And I'm like, there's a recurring theme here. Sophos likes crack as their password. I don't know. I mean, it keeps saying crack everywhere, so. Uh, I, thought that, I thought that was funny. So, I know I just went over a ton of bugs and you guys are like, oh my god, I don't want to see any more bugs today. Um, well, you don't have to if you don't go to any more talks. But uh, I'm sure there'll be more somewhere else. Uh, but I hope, hope you get like a good feel of uh, how fertile the territory is for, the, for virtual appliances. Uh, but I did talk to the vendors somewhat. I told you to talk to VMware. Talk to the other vendors along the way as well. Um, and I just want to briefly go through some of the timeline. So SolarWinds, I know you probably understand this from reading it. I should have fixed this, but um, so when I first contact SolarWinds, they're like, hey, thanks for your email. 
we'll send you our PGP key soon. And I'm like, all right, I don't know why there's a delay there. Are you either generating it or you just misplaced it? I don't know. Uh, but they got it to me like two weeks later. I was like, what, what the hell is, why are you telling me, sending me soon? Let's, anyways, fixed it five months later. Uh, EMC, like I said, they fixed it just over a month. That was super fast. And I think the guy that helped me at VMC or EMC actually left. And I'm like, wow, if I have any more bugs, that's probably not going to go as smoothly now because this guy was really good. Um, and then Penumpia, they in in the they fixed it and they noted in the advisory patch potential security vulnerability. Um, I just got remote root on your box. That's not potential. That is <laughs> that is uh, you patched a security vulnerability there. And uh, I know there's a lot of Cisco ones. Um, but for prime infrastructure, I hate the way they I hate the way they do advisories here. They release an advisory, but it's like private. You have to log into Cisco to view all this stuff. And I'm like, so anyone in Google is going to search for bugs in this? They're never going to find this advisory unless they uh, have an account on Cisco. So didn't think that was very uh, open. And the other ones, uh, if I'm not discussing them here, then they're uh, you know, user imagination. So. Recommendations for vendors. Are there any vendors from Cisco, VMware, EMC, SolarWinds, a ton of other ones I talked about? Assume every file on the system be audited. Uh, because if you're shipping these things, I mean, most likely somebody's going to be able to either dynamically or statically look at it unless you found another way to, to really lock it down. And clean it up before you ship. I cannot believe the amount of appliances I found shipping .sh and .vim directories with all the history. It's just like, I mean that's that should be that should be on your checklist of things not to do. Uh, firewalling, if you're you know defensive wise, is great practice for this unless you give me a remote shell and allow me to suit root the firewall binary and turn it off. Uh, besides that, it's pretty good because um, unless you're auditing a service that's only on local host or unless it's like unless the web service is talking to the local host and you can manipulate it there, that would be interesting. But besides that, if you can't access it remotely. You know, local privilege escalation is it's not worth as much to remote, of course. Uh, and then make, like I was harping on before, make uh, all the pa users generate passwords uh, when you ship it. That is so easy. Just generate the password, set it randomly upon install, give it to the user on the screen. People do it. It, it works. Uh, and this one was another Cisco virtual appliance. From prime collaboration deployment. Uh, so another thing I thought was, was pretty good for security blacklisting the users from remote access. So this one actually had Informix and Informix as username and password, but you couldn't exploit it because uh, if you look at the uh, remote remote shell configuration file, they lock, they, they block those users. So you're kind of like, ah, and then it's gone. But that, that's good. It's good for security if, you, if you're trying to lock down a, an appliance. Uh, and definitely do not mix demos, trials. Be straightforward with what you're giving people. I don't know how many times I've, I've looked at one and said, oh, this is a trial. You can upgrade it uh, to a full version if you buy it. And then they're like, well, it's only for demonstration purposes, not for production. And then it's like, well, uh, we, we, you know, there's all these ambiguations. It's like, t if it's a demo, say it's a demo. If it's a trial, say it's a trial. Um, of course, don't ship the master development VM. A lot of these look like development VMs, which is a, a problem. It's hard to keep track of those things. And a checklist of must not haves. Do not ship crazy sensitive directories uh, and bash history. Do not ship bash history. You know what that is. There's a history of all the commands you typed. You may screw something up, leak a password or two. Um, and some of the just thoughts I have in closing, uh, there's a lot of installation collateral, so that's pretty good to look at and analyze and see how they do things in the system, how they set passwords, how they're installing services. Um, there's a lot of support services and remote access. So that'd be really good to look at for, for bugs in the future. And read the documentation. There's a few that I've looked at, and I'm like, ah, oh, man, it's a really good bug. And I look at the documentation, and it's right there. And, and there's other combinations of that, too. but. Uh, you know, a feature in this industry very well could be a bug in your advantage, uh, if that makes sense. Um, you can use it for, uh, for your purposes. And forensics, honestly, oh, if, I had, if I had just a million dollars or $500,000, however much those forensic suits cost, because they cost a lot of money, to look at uh, the file, all the files they deleted. I had like some free trial to look at the uh, imaging stuff, but 
If you had like a million dollar forensic software, I'm pretty sure you could uncover all kinds of really cool deleted files. Because like I said, a lot of these are development images and they just like, oh, we gotta delete the stuff, or they don't. Uh, but even if they do, you can maybe recover that. And there you go. And things are really heating up. I think this is like a Cisco presentation, I feel like I keep mentioning them. But they just have so many, and this is like more, uh, WSA, ESA, and SMA. So they actually, on the system, they left the, I think, private keys uh, on the virtual appliances. So once they leak, and they're root, and you get root access with these. Uh, so they released advisory a month or two ago about this, and uh, I was like, wow, this, people are starting to pay attention to these appliances now. Um, there's a lot of stuff to do here, uh, as every talk ends, right? It's never finished. Um, and they're only going to become more prevalent. Uh, Metal to bits is just, it just makes sense these days. It's cheaper, data centers everywhere, cloud in the sky. Um, but uh, getting access to these is one hurdle, as you can see, uh, recently, if you guys have been following anywhere. Um, and then getting them properly fixed the bugs is another, like the, the Sophos one. It's like two years ago, they said they would fix the bug. It's, st it's still there. So that is all I got. Questions, and if, before do anything else, if you ask a question, I have some free stuff to give you. Uh, I have either t-shirts, which I think you'll like, or socks. So if you ask a question, if you ask me a good question, don't ask me a stupid question, ask me a good question, I'll probably give you something and it'll be up to you which one you get. All right? So any questions? If that didn't make you ask one, nothing will. Uh, I think he was up first, sorry. Um. I don't know when DerbyCon does that, uh, but if you take my card or something, shoot me an email and I, I can give it to you uh, as soon as you need them. Yes? Oh. I went through any VMware turnkey, uh, I heard of turnkey somewhere. Um, only one, only VMware one I looked at, I looked at a few, but this one was the only one uh, that was kind of interesting with security stuff. Um, but a lot of them I just can't get access to because you either have to buy them. There's not a lot of free trials for those. Um, so, sorry, before we go any further, would you, first question, would you like a socks or t-shirt? Or what size? XO. Nobody else leave. I still see you. <laughs> Take advantage of me when I'm uh, down on the podium here. All right, XO. XO, I think this is XO. I'm not going to show you what it says till you get it. I'm going to throw it. All right, and you, sir, t-shirt or socks? T-shirt. Uh, I don't. I have medium and large. Large work. You're welcome. I can't. I can't let that go away right now. We need. We need a little more time to make. Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, so a lot of them uh, are encrypted and you can't look at them statically. So the ones that I could look at statically, I want to because you know, that's where you get the most access usually or else you have to mount the file, you have to like run it and then, you know, Hopefully you can SSH in and do like SFTP, copy the files over or the file system. But yeah, I just I mounted the image, I converted it. On one of the slides I showed how you can do it with a QMU image and you can convert it into a RAW. First you have to convert it from a VMDK or whatever. Convert it to a RAW and then open it up in an imager and uh, on the slides it has all the, all the names of the imager I used and stuff. But uh, yeah, that's how I did it. Mostly static if I could. Uh, sometimes you just you can't if you don't have the key. Or, yeah, because it uses the on boot. Anyways, uh, t shirt or socks? It, if you wear a medium. I only have a medium left in shirts. I do have socks, though. So. All right. Socks are easier, maybe easier to throw. Ooh, on fire. Yes. Oh, what was the name of the format? OS? OSVM formats. 
I use OVF, which is the, the container, OSVM. Oh, OVF, yeah. So that's a container which uh, you can use to load in VMware that'll, that'll uh, so th that's just, that's just going to tell it what image to use for it, basically. So yeah, I did work with OVMs a lot, OVAs, which is the, uh, the another format for it, uh, but I did work with those. But, all right, uh, so socks or t medium t-shirt? Socks? All right. I just want to throw stuff, really. I, just, I was like, I'm really excited to get the end of this. That was, that was on you. That's not me. That was a good throw. Sorry. Uh, I think he had his hand up first. Sorry. I didn't write any plugins with it. Uh, I don't think I've written a plugin in like five years since I worked there. Uh, but yeah, I actually I got that question before. You know. Uh, you, you definitely could write an SS plugin for that, definitely. You could write a Metasploit module as well. Uh, but yeah, that's a good question though. Uh, socks or t-shirt? You want to go socks? Wire medium, I don't know. All right, I got one medium t-shirt left, so if you're, look at yourself for a minute. Okay. All right, yes sir. I can't, I'm sorry, I can't hear you. Uh, I'm trying to think. So I looked at a device that I didn't do it, I didn't use the physical device to do it, but I downloaded the firmware and did some reversing from there on the firmware. So I did use Benwalk on that, I think, uh, to look at the firmware, but I didn't uh, use it on um, the actual, I didn't dump it from the chip. I just downloaded the firmware before I installed it on the device. Um, but I didn't really, there's not a lot, because the thing with embedded devices, they're so, there's not a lot of room usually. So, so like with OS image, it's like, hey, I have like gigabytes, and just dump this and that. There is like, we gotta conserve space, so we're only putting the bare minimum on it. So it makes security a little bit easier for, for embedded devices. Right. Yeah, I think it's smaller, so they they get that advantage from security there, where it's like, ah, we can't fit all these passwords on here, like that. Uh, you want t-shirt, medium? Yeah. All right. I don't know if I can throw that far. You might have to come up a little bit. Oh, oh, sorry. She called it. I don't know. You might want to. All right. I don't have any more stuff, but I will take questions. Sure. Yes. Uh, I haven't. I don't have that much money. <laughs> it's a lot of money. You look familiar, I swear I think I know you somewhere. Familiar, I'm gonna talk to you in a bit. Uh, yes. You would use it more on a running system where you'd be wanting to look at passwords that, like the, the operators already typed in and stuff in the memory, unless they were, uh, I, don't know if it, I would imagine it's kind of volatile at that point. I don't think it would be very applicable um, unless you were physically doing like maybe a pen test physically and you were there and then you had access to the system after someone was already there doing a bunch of stuff. Then that would be applicable, I think. Uh, but good question. Good question. Yes. Yeah, yeah, I'm trying to think of a funny core files on the systems. That would definitely, uh, yeah, that would definitely contain some information. Hopefully, uh, yeah, yeah, that would be something good to find on a system. I would like to find core files because you may find some, some interesting stuff in the memory from those as well. Question. Any other questions? Right back there. Okay, uh, the only one I've looked at in that realm, I believe, was, was the first Cisco one, the paging compliance. So they rebranded it, they OEM'd it for uh, single wire or something. And that was really confusing because I was trying to look for documentation too, and I'm like, is this Cisco paging server or is this single wire, single application or whatever, VM? Um, but yeah, I could see some overlap there where 
you know, the, the actual vendor of the OS, or the vendor that, that's um, providing it to the OEM puts a, puts a bunch of stuff, or vice versa, and them not being able to cover the security on both ends. And maybe they don't even have access to some of the stuff that they're, maybe they don't have the source code to put it on there, so they can't verify a lot of the security anyways. Um, so I haven't, I haven't looked at that, but uh, yeah, that, that's, a, that's a good thing to look at in the future, definitely. Question. Any other questions? I wish I brought more stuff now. You guys would be, every one of you would be asking. I only had six items, so. Um, all right, thank you very much. Appreciate it.